Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my, my third talk in three consecutive days, each one in a different, uh, for a different discipline, I guess. And, and I'm a physicist, so, so it's just, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to talk uh, here, mostly to physicists, I think. And, and well, uh, of course, it's, it's, a bit, it's, it's an ambitious title, and I, and, and, I, and I won't, I mean, get to the expectations that this title may have. So I'll, I'll just start with very brief history, uh, which I think may, may help set the topic. So, so this is Lavoisier in his good days uh, of, of science and life. And, and, and I thought that it, it was worth bringing this. So, so this is in French, sorry, but, but I, I'll read it for you. He says, uh, we know that our objects of nature are immersed in caloric. So we, we all knew something that actually was quite wrong. And that it, for caloric, fills all the intervals uh, of space between the molecules. And that it, the caloric, exerts uh, a force over molecules uh, that has an action. And that it, the accumulation of this force, being it larger or smaller, makes uh, objects change from different states. And, and as, as you may know, I mean, this is, I know there are here some historians of science. Uh, Carnot, uh, who I guess we all studied uh, up to date, all, all the essences of thermodynamics based of, of Carnot, uh, f built his, his machine and his ideas and his theory based on this uh, completely wrong conception of what he was about. And, and, and the reason I'm bringing, well, first, <laughs> this is what happens when you get a wrong idea, then seven years later, uh, this is what the revolution <laughs> That's to you. Of course, then there was the issue of the fight with Marat, who himself, actually it's interesting because Marat from a scientific perspective uh, was, as, as I, 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 many of you also may know, uh, very influenced by, by the German school of, of, of animal magnetism or mesmerism or hypnosis. Uh, and, and this was part of a, of a very fundamental discussion among other ones that, that Marat and Lavoisier had at the time. And when Marat was killed, many thought that Lavoisier was, was way involved in that. And somehow there was an, an, an action of revenge. And, and also, as, uh, and again, I'm not a historian of science, so this may, 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 may not be quite precise. But the story goes that, that when he was in prison and, and knowing that he would be executed, Lavoisier asked for time uh, to finish some of his ideas. And, and, and then the answer was that the, the Republic didn't need a scientist or geniuses or people that were thinking on these issues. And he was nevertheless executed. But the reason I'm bringing this is because I think it, it does set the frame on, of course, the, the, I'd like to present an analogy of, of heat at the time of Lavoisier and consciousness in our days as an object for which we have a, a deep misunderstanding of, of its essential nature. I think that anyone today claiming that we have an understanding, of, a philosophical understanding of the nature of consciousness would be, in a way, failing to truth. I think that we have, we do have a lot of approximations. And I will try today to give you a, 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 sh a short view of, of how science has allowed us. And, and, and I think the, the reason, again, that, that I brought this is because I think that we can do tangible and reasonable science even with deep uh, philosophical misconceptions. And I think that this is one of the most extraordinary examples of how physics achieved. But then the question is, is what is a safe ground for doing this? And, and I think that, that science need the, the science, and this is not a general statement for science, but for this particular kind of science in which we are really in the dark of the philosophical nature of the science we are doing, it needs to be very concrete. It needs to be grounded to things that actually are, 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 have a, a practical implementation. So this is maybe just an excuse in, in front of, 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 of a physics audience to say that, that the science we'll be doing is in a way theoryless. Or, or it doesn't have, or it's not anchored on a strong theoretical conception. I, I think I could go this way, but in my opinion, this is not the way that the science of consciousness has to go today, because I don't think it's yet mature from our current understanding of the essential structure and the essential signatures of this process to actually uh, build theory. So it's going to be, in a way, quite humble, I'd say, in that, that the only thing I, I aspire to, to show you is, is, is certain traces of structure of how we can actually hint uh, notions of consciousness and eventually manipulate it, and, and, but still recognizing that we are uh, deeply ignorant on the fundamental substrate of, of the science. So this is, a, this is a, I'd like to, so the talk is organized as, as the present, the past, and the future of, of consciousness. And you'll see why. First, our, our understanding of consciousness today. This is, a, I mean, a typical uh, neuroscience experiment of, a, of, of part of a, of a massive industry. 
that goes on, on bringing people to a scanner, which is an, an fMRI machine, which essentially builds on the fact that oxygenated hemoglobulin has different magnetic properties than deoxygenated hemoglobulin. And so it measures neural activity as from an indirect measure, which has a very coarse temporal and spatial filter, because we're not measuring neural activity, we're measuring the oxygenation of capillaries that surround this neural tissue that actually have a boost of oxygen as a consequence of uh, oxygen. So there is a very small process of uh, the, the metabolic expense of, of neural consumption is very low. It consumes ox oxygen. But there is a rebound, which is an order of magnitude larger than the oxygen that was consumed. And this is the one thing that can be measured with fMRI. And the second thing is that whenever, of course, and, 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 and I think that you're familiar with this, when you see like something like it, so this is the, in a way, the, the brain activity of someone that closes their eyes and imagines that play tennis. And this does not mean that this is the only region which, yeah, imagines, <laughs> imagines. It's not playing tennis. No, yeah, 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 yeah. I was wondering what the Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you could, but this, but yeah, but this, this is imagined. But I'll, I'll go to a point because if you would play tennis, so, I mean, because you asked this question, these, these regions do have names, and, and these names actually have to do with, with known functions for these specific regions. And I, in this talk, I would almost, Ex with only this exception, I will not uh, say anything about this because I think it's mo mostly meaningless. But this SMA stands for supplementary motor area. This is a region of the brain that actually controls the muscles. So you see that the imagination of playing tennis actually engages regions of the brain, which are very similar to the ones that would be engaged if you would actually be playing tennis. Or of course, dancing or playing basket. This is not the brain region for playing tennis. This thing, of course, does not exist. Although this, was, this would be the title of the newspaper saying, Neuroscientists found the feather region of the brain. Um, so, but of course, and then the other thing you can imagine is that this is a, 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 a what, what one is doing is, is, is that, that there's a parcellation of the brain at the different degrees of resolution that, that the technique may have. And this depends on the scanner and how it's implemented and the sequences that they're being used. Typically, the, the brain is, 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 is parsed in about 30, it's, it's done in slices, and it's 35 slices, each of which are 100 times 100 a voxels. So it's in the order of magnitudes of 10,000 of voxels. This is the, and so one is running 10,000 statistical tests, which of course has all the issue of multiple comparisons, which neuroscientists often deal very wrongly, and so come with typically very wrong conclusions, but often it's done right. And what you see here as shiny reg regions means that those voxels tend to be more active when the person is imagining that they play tennis compared to when they're doing something different, which typically it's called doing nothing or just being silently and calm this kind of course the brain never shuts down. So whatever is called as the default or the basal state of the brain, which is compared to this is not a quiescent state. So, so again, this is now uh, again, uh, this is a, a, a very typical study. There are thousands of these. This is what, uh, again, this, this statistical summary, core statistical summary of what goes in the brain when a person imagines that they play tennis. And this is what goes in the brain when a person imagines that they're navigating their houses. We mammals have an extraordinary system for spatial navigation. And if you just begin to think the number of, of maps that you have installed in your, like if you imagine going from here to your work, to your house, from, to your, from a house to your friend's house, from here to New York, from New York to Paris, I mean, the number of uh, maps, spatial maps that we have is immense. It's one of the most uh, expressive forms of mammalian memory. And this includes human memory. We are not that different to mice. And again, this involves other structures whose, that could be the subject of a talk, but here they're not very meaningful. The, the, the one thing I wanted to, the reason I, I, I began my talk with this is because typically this is framed like this. So this is what goes in the brain when you imagine so X. And this is what goes on in the brain when you imagine Y. But of course, this problem can be inverted. And one can play the game of trying to think what the other person is thinking based on the, of the, activity, of, of, of the activity in the brain, on the, nerve of, on the brain patterns of activity. So I could play the game of not asking what the other person is thinking, but trying to guess it and to infer it from the perspective of a decoder that is using the patterns of brain activity on and that has been calibrated for this purpose. And you see immediately that part of the advantage of X and Y here is that their spatial distribution is very orthogonal. And so it's, very, it's quite easy to distinguish between these two things compared, for instance, if I would want to distinguish if the person is thinking on playing tennis or playing hockey, which would lead to very overlapping uh, patterns of brain activity. 
And so this is a way that, that, that one can read the other person's mind based on, on patterns of, of brain activity. Of course, it's very expensive. It's about $3 million. And it's just easier to ask the other person, like, what, like raise your hand if you're thinking. So the question is why on earth one would even begin this program. But it, became, it becomes very obvious when actually asking is not possible. And over the last years, uh, we've seen this all over the media. It's, it's, so their medicine, as, as you know, has very uneven progresses. And medicine has been very good in, in making people that arrive in comatose states after accidents, either from, from physical accidents or from vascular accidents, to survive. But typically, these people arrive with substantial brain damage. And so they persist in a seemingly comatose state which has been referred as vegetative state patients, or for which you've, I mean, there have been many, many, many famous cases, unfortunately, for this. And so these are just a few movies that have come up in the last years because it's been a topic that has attracted a lot of media attention. So the question is, when you have a patient that is vegetative state, is this patient really in the vegetative? Look, the, the term vegetative state, of course, is tremendously strong. It's making a strong claim about the fact that the person on the other side is as if they were you know, uh, uh, well, and, 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 and the question is, is of course this is the best inference that we can make because there is nothing that these patients are, express, are expressing that denotes that this agent actually has a conscious mind. But could it be that they have a, con that they have a conscious mind only that it's not expressible by the typical vehicles that we have to convey our thoughts? And so Adrian Owen, in a patient that then we studied for a long time, did this experiment early, there was now almost 10 years ago. And so here you have a very simple vehicle. You can try to ask the other, you can try to read the mind of this person that cannot speak their thoughts and ask the question of whether they are capable of, to the best of your guesses, producing thoughts because they produce brain patterns that are compatible with these thought patterns. And so uh, he asked or, or this, uh, this, this woman, it was a woman, uh, to think that she was playing tennis and she asked this woman to uh, imagine that she was navigating her house uh, and, and she got this pattern of activity. And this is, again, this, this, this does not mean that the person is conscious. This is suggestive that they can, that, that somehow they can understand these words and they can engage in a process that has all these similitudes with processes for which we have the pre fingerprints of, of conscious imagination. But the whole thing could be, I mean, there, there's nothing here that tells us that the conscious experience of this person is similar to the conscious experience of the person that actually um, uh, uh, played this experiment in, in the controls. Now, again, from a purely engineering perspective, and, and again, I want to emphasize the necessity of navigating these waters with this science. This is then, you, I mean, you, essentially, you have, a, you have a binary communication device. You can start asking questions by saying, respond me yes. If you want to respond me yes, imagine that you play tennis. And if you want to say no, imagine that you navigate a, a, a space. And of course, this, this communication device, which is tremendously slow, it's about one beat every five minutes. But that's infinite more than nothing, which is you have to think that this person was in vegetative states in complete incommunication for five years. And suddenly, there is a very rudimentary, but nevertheless, a window in which she can express the content of her thoughts. And so the game you want to play again, and it's a very slow communication device, is if you want to say yes, uh, then uh, imagine this. If you want to say no, then imagine uh, why. And, and, and you play this game on, on questions for which the answer is you know, of course, like are, are you a woman, are you a man, are you older than 40, is, do you have siblings, uh, blah, 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 do you live in Boston? And all are questions that you can calibrate your system. And once it's calibrated, which f just for a very small number of patients, Today it can be done. So about, I'd say, uh, less than 5% of the VS patients actually can achieve this state, uh, or, or, or this is observable. Then you can start asking the questions which are relevant. How do you feel? Are you suffering? What would you like to do? How, I mean, very fundamental questions. So I want to present how, again, very uh, deep state of ignorance, yet it changes quite completely our perspective of communication uh, with other people. Yes. Yes, that's exactly. And, and the reason it, why you do it with tennis and walking and why this part seemingly very arbitrary choice is because these two things are, have very different spatial patterns. In the, have, they happen to have very different spatial patterns, and they're quite easy to decode. So, so if, you would if you would make other choice, then it would be just a more lousy decoder because it's being filtered by, by these spatial patterns. 
Uh, yeah, that's that's exactly how it works. That I don't know. I, I think I think it would. Yeah, you don't need a lot. I mean, I mean, there may be subtle differences, but again, I don't think it's on the essence. I, I don't know. Uh, it probably. I mean, yeah, things do change in the brain when when it's experts doing them. So uh, we were speaking two days ago about chess players. So if if you look, uh, 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 grandmaster playing playing chess, the pattern of brain activity would be very different than a naive chess player. You would use completely different structures, and probably the same for a physicist doing physics uh, and compared to. But here, I don't think that matters too much. Okay, so again, this is a an, 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 an essential, I mean, a, 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 a very a, um, concrete idea. And, and I'm going to dwell in this idea for, for one or two more examples, and then I'll go to something different. Um, this, of course, uh, has, uh, has, has important practical applications. But, but and you see, in a way, what, what one is trying to do is coming up with a test of consciousness. It's, it's, it, and in the end, it's a Turing test. So what one would want to know is, how can I tell if the another agent is conscious or not? And as a probe, just like on a probe for consciousness here, we're using the capacity of understanding language and the capacity of, a, of producing imagination of a specific semantic component. But this, of course, is a, is, a, is, a, is a lower bound for consciousness. You can imagine that someone can be conscious and yet not understand language or not being able to do this. So the question is, is what is the minimal uh, a probe that one can have to assess consciousness in another agent? Yes? Yeah, yeah. I'll go to that in five minutes. They do wake up. So first, this is very rare. The majority of the, and this is important to say for practical terms, I and mean, the majority, when you do this, this type of studies, in the majority of these patients, you won't see any trace of consciousness. And the majority of these patients have a very, very, very bad pro uh, prognosis. Uh, some of them, you do see these things, and I'll show you in a second, this is correlated with the likelihood that then they may, may wake up, which is why these things are relevant. In the vast majority of cases, with, with some very minor exceptions, they don't remember anything. They don't remember that they were in a scanner. They don't remember that, that they were. They, and often, they don't even remember that they've been maybe for seven or eight years. So there is a very strong amnesia. There are cases which are, I mean, this has been very well documented in anesthesia. Anesthesia is, a, is, a, is a, another situation, and I'll go on to that on, on 10 minutes. Anesthesia is another situation in which you just block consciousness for a second. But the problem, I don't want to scare you with it, but the problem with anesthesia is that typically they do two things, the majority of the anesthetics. Some of them, I mean, depends, but they, 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 uh, they, they do what anesthesia is supposed to do. So they change the, the, the perception and the feelings and the, of, the, of out, outside experience and of pain. But also they block all the muscles. And, and so those are two different compounds. And the reason this is done is because the, the, the surgeon doesn't want you to move abruptly during. So essentially, you are completely, or one is completely paralyzed while, uh, during, uh, during most surgical procedures. So if anesthesia doesn't work, but one person is paralyzed, it's a huge problem. Because you can be in an incredible nightmare, but you cannot express it. Like your face is completely as if you would be in the most relaxed state. So there was a surgeon that did it. They were, in the 70s, they were using these op opioids as, as, as anesthetics that were very and there was a surgeon that, that, that was skeptic about the capacity of these anesthetics to do what they were doing. And so what he did is that he, he delivered the drug for, for paralyzing, except that he blocked it in the arm. And so, so people could move their hand. They were completely paralyzed except for the hand. And so during the surgery, they talked to the patient saying something like, are you awake? Move your hand and move your hand. Are you suffering? Are you having the worst suffering you can ever imagine? So the patient was in complete, uh, with, again, with a, a face of, of, of complete pleasure because they were completely paralyzed. So, uh, uh, and when they woke up from surgery, the doctor asked, so how was the surgical experience? And they said, perfect, no memories. And so this is part of the problem. And it's a, it's a huge fundamental and essential problem in the research of consciousness, which is that typically the way we express consciousness is by retrospective memories of our conscious experience, which are not a faithful a, a, a report of our actual conscious experience. So, so you're leading there something which is not important only for that, but it's, 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 a, it's a general methodological difficulty of, of the entire field. This is particularly important in dreams. I mean, it's very difficult to know whether dreams really happen the way we perceive them or they're actually constructions uh, of, of the morning, so to say. So, so the question is, is again, it's, it's, it's going down. And again, in, a, in very practical and concrete terms on how to find these, these minimal probes, 
and, and one interesting idea about consciousness that we've learned uh, 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 about in the last 200 years of psychological research of consciousness is that in general, I think that a very a, a first intuition that comes to mind is that consciousness has to do with very sophisticated uh, human computation, so it, and, and that it is related to intelligence. And for all we know, that's, 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 that's far from truth. There are very simple and basic computations that we would never associate to, to, to sophisticated forms of intelligence that are actually imperative for, that consciousness is imperative for them. And there are very elaborated and sophisticated forms of thought uh, that we can actually have without consciousness. So one thing that, it's, that consciousness is, need, is, is known to be needed for, and again, this comes from, from years of psychological research that I will summarize in two minutes, is to bind things in time. So essentially, the, the unconscious mind is very reflexive. It, so you feel something is cold, and then eventually you get out of it. Something is warm, you get close. You sense food, and you go towards that. There is a, a whole set of, of, of stereotypical computations that can be very sophisticated, because they can involve very complex recognition machineries, but that live in the immediacy of the present. When you need to flexibly link, you can also eventually have memories, but these memories are quite stereotypical. In the moment that you need to flexibly link information now to action, even just the seconds after that, holding this information flexibly is something, again, it's, a, it's an empirical fact for which consciousness seems to be imperative. And so Larry Squire, one of the most uh, important uh, uh, persons over the last 40 or 50 years to have worked the, 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 the psychology and to a large extent the, the neuroscience of memory, uh, came up with, with this experiment that, that uh, about 20 years ago was, was quite influential where what he did is, is a very, like an old Pavlovian, so this is Pavlov and his dog, uh, experiment in which essentially you have to learn, in which a person has to learn the association between a stimulus which has no meaning by itself, so it's an abstract stimulus, and something which is aversive in this case. So the experiment goes like this. A person is watching a movie and it's important because they need to be distracted. And while they're watching a movie, there, there are beeps, there are tones, like there's boop, beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, beep. And there are also uh, puffs to the, to, the, to the eyelid. So essentially there's, there's a, a, a very, uh, uh, so there's the machine that actually every now and then will, psh, will provide a puff. And this is just a slightly uncomfortable feeling. And what people will do is they will just close their eyelids. And you see that there's a very a simple structure here. It can, be, it can get more and more complicated, which is that, that one of the two tones is completely predictive of the puff, which here is labeled as, as, a, as, a, as a red square. And the other one is predictive of the lack or the, it, it actually indicates that there is no, no path. It's very simple, and actually, this relation people can learn while they're asleep. Uh, worms learn it, uh, and, and eventually you can take an, an animal and almost leave the, the parts of the brain that have to do with, the, with, the, with, the, with hearing and with the, the motor control of the eyelid, and this will work. So it's a very, again, simple operation. Now, you just separate this by a second, there are extremely minimal modification in which there's, again, this is predictive and it's predictive, but only to predict something that will happen a second after that. And then, again, experimental uh, a discovery by Larry Squire in, in many, 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 many papers doing that, is that then consciousness is imperative by that. And there are many demonstrations of this. The simplest one is, again, uh, uh, that, that what happens, and I will show you this in a second, is that if you learn that, this, that there is a relation between these two things. What subjects do is before, when they hear this tone, they start closing the eyelid because they, they have learned that there is a relation. And so this is, this is just learning the relation between a conditioned stimulus and the aversive stimulus. And only subjects that later on report explicitly the relation between these things actually have this form of learning. So subjects will be in the movie. And some of them uh, will ca have come out and they ask, well, what was this about? They were, well, it was a movie and then there were some tones and there was this disturbing path in the eyelid. Was there a relation between them? No, no, I didn't notice. These subjects do not show the physiological learning. They will not just close their eyelid. Some subjects will say, yeah, I, 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 I noticed. So they can explicitly, they are aware of the contingency. They're conscious of the contingency. And they report uh, in, the, in, the, yeah, in the high tone, there was a, a puff, an air puff, and in the low tone there wasn't. And these subjects do show the, the, the physiological response of closing the eyelid just before the onset of the puff. So there was a, there was a and this, you know, it's, it's like, a, I think it's a very typical thing that how I like 
to think many, many of these things in science, which is now, now this experiment becomes a bridge between one thing which we would like to know, is the other person conscious? The other person now is a vegetative state patient. This we want to know. And something we can measure. Is the other person capable of moving their eyes to anticipate an error path? This is something that these patients can do. We are sure that they can do. And now we have, again, just a, a, a relation between something we want to ask to the patient and something. Uh, I, I just didn't understand. So when there's a high tone. Yes. Yeah, so some people were and some weren't. Yes, but for the people who weren't aware of it, did they close their eyes? They didn't close their, their eyes before. So they didn't close their eyes before. So, so what we call the physiological learning, which is the fact that you close your eyes before the air puff, only happened if you were aware of the contingency. If this relation is made short of 300 milliseconds, even if you're completely unaware of the contingency, you still will make the physiological response. So just the idea of stretching this for a second, again, binding information. And so again, this seemed as a much more minimal probe of consciousness that I want to show before. And I'll go through this. I had all the data, but I think I'll go. Yes. Very rapid uh, trials. Six trials. Between six and seven trials, it's learned. It depends on the complexity. So we've done this experiments also with semantics. So you have to learn that there's a semantic category. But in this experiment like this, it's six, six trials, it's learned if you're aware uh, of this. And, and uh, uh, yeah, animals, animals learn it. In trace learning, animals learn it too, which is an, uh, I mean, very rapid, yes, very rapid. This form of learning, yeah, is, it's very rapid, yes. So this is an issue because, because uh, so, so, so a worm will learn that. And, and, and then the question is, is the worm conscious or is this not a probe for consciousness in worms? So, so, the, the, and, and so in humans, we know that they have to be conscious in order to learn this. And, and yes, it's a, we have like a, an entire paper in ethics on this issue on, on, on what are the implications for this to on other animals. My, my own take on this, because this is not true for any general machine. And this is very important. I think that, and, and all the, the, what I'll be showing in this fir first part of the lecture is that I think we do have reliable signatures of the physiology of consciousness in the human brain. So things that we know that are, are, have a, a strong correlation with the phenom phenomenology of consciousness in the human brain. This does not translate to any other architecture. This doesn't mean that, of course, you can be like a computer that does this very easily and it's not conscious. So those are not minimal probes for, for, for a, a, a physical system instantiating consciousness. They seem to be correlations of, of when consciousness is expressed in the human brain. So I think that this is, this is as far as the analogies that we can make. So I'm, I'm going to make this quite, quite a, a fast in the sake of time. If you want and, and have questions and details, I can go. But the result was that, again, this is, this is now, now you're seeing, again, we, the, the one thing we can measure, which is, which is the, the electromyographic signal in the eyelid of these patients. This is something for which they are particularly responsive. And this is humans. And, and, and what you see here is the, this is the baseline. And this, is, this stands for early anticipatory or late anticipatory. So this is the time interval before the path. In the moment of the path, there's a, there's a very strong contraction of the eyelid. So there's a very strong myographic uh, signal, which I'm not sh showing here, uh, electromyographic signal. And, and you see that in the high pitch, so what's called the conditioned stimulus, is the one that, that predicts the aversive tone. There is a buildup of signal. In patients with anesthesia, which is a, 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 a control for unconsciousness, we trust this anesthesia. And we think that this is our ground truth for someone being completely unconscious. We do not see any anticipatory response, although there would be a response to the, to the air puff. They will actually close their lids. I'm, unfortunately, I don't have this slide here. But there's a very strong, I mean, it's a comparable response for that. And in the, in, in the in vegetative spa state patients, there is, of course, something in between. And it's important to know whether this something in between is the average of many things in between, or it's a, or it's a wide distribution of some patients responding and others do not responding. And this is what this histogram tries to tell. So what you have here is the value of the MEG signal in black in the, just before the onset of the path. And this is measured in standard deviations of the fluctuations of the signal before, uh, before actually the trial commences. And, and, and you see, 
that not all, actually not all, all, all normals are responsive, uh, which, which happens. I mean, this is, not, this is not a perfectly reliable signal. It's, it's a signal that, that, that for many different reasons, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's just a correlation. It's a very significant correlation, but it's not a one-to-one -one prediction. And you see that there is a, uh, 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 it's skewed to the, to the left, but you see that there are some uh, vegetative state patients uh, or that actually uh, show comparable uh, degrees uh, of learning. So again, we cannot tell, but from these sets of conclusions, the experiment of Larry Squire showing that to show this form of learning, you need to be conscious. You may be conscious and not show this form of learning. So it doesn't work for, for, for false positives. But you need to be conscious to, learn, to have this learning. The observation that there are a certain amount of patients, so this is a histogram in the counts of patients. So there is like three, four patients that showed out of about 17 or something that show significant learning. Uh, but again, we, we, we cannot say they're conscious. We can say that for if, if we make the translational hypothesis that what we can measure in a, in a person that has a state of awareness and that can report consciousness of not of the contingency is indicative of, 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 of consciousness, we can translate it uh, to these patients and make these conclusions. But the one thing we could do, and that goes to the question you were asking is, uh, I, I don't know how it's in physics, but in biology papers, like in the moment you finish them till the moment you publish them, it's like uh, typically two, one year at least. I mean, it's, it's a very long, very slow time scale. And, and this is bad for students, and it's bad for us, but it's good for, for the validity of science because it allows you to, to keep on. And so what happened is that this paper stood for a long time, and in the meanwhile, patients were changing their state before we actually ended up publishing. So by the time this, this research was, since we started until we published, many of them have, had changed the state, and we could ask if there was a relation between the prognosis of this tremendously simple measurement, which was based, again, on a, on a trace that could uh, tell us wh whether, whether there was a probe for consciousness in these patients. And so what you have here is the t-value of, of, of learning. So this is the difference in MEG activity between the anticipatory state and the baseline. So if this is high, it means that the, that the signal ramped up. And what you have here is whether was, there was a state change. And state change in these patients means that they are, uh, again, those are medical scores that go all the way from 0 to 10. And that they aggregate things like eventually they show moments in which they're responsive. So this would be something like a 6. Or they do show some measure of control. Or they do have some measure of communication. All the way up to 10, which is complete recovery. So again, not all of these patients recover. State change means that there was, that there was a, a significant improvement in their medical assessment of, of, of the degree of consciousness. Uh, and some of them actually recover. And the ones that did recover, in this study it was two of them, uh, had absolutely no memory of, of, of this entire process. I don't understand the data. One who is recovered from So the ones, so, so here, here's on the, on the left, it's, it's that there was state change means that there was a substantial uh, uh, recovery. Improvement means that there's a partial. Uh, so those are, those are medical degrees of improvement. And it goes from no improvement to moderate improvement to substantial improvement. Uh, and what you have here, I'm showing that's correlated with this very simple measure of whether they're capable of learning something that's delayed just in, in one second, again, as a probe of consciousness. This does not mean, again, this is yet an indirect measure. But it's an indirect measure that maybe they were closer to consciousness in the sense that they actually uh, showed, showed. And, and again, from a practical perspective, it's the most important one. Because in one of these patients, the most important question for all action that you can make is what is the likelihood that they will improve or not. And in this sense, it's, it's, it's interesting because this was very simple and very cheap in a way. But at the time, it was, I think, one of maybe the best uh, uh, predictor that we had of the likelihood that these patients would actually change, much better than many more sophisticated signals. Yes? Yeah, so the first one was the yeah, no, it's not that it, you don't choose to learn. So what I'm saying is that if you get a negative here, that doesn't mean that they do not have consciousness, that, that, that they are not aware. You have patients that you know that they are patients. You have normals we call a not yet diagnosed patients. I mean, we are all patients. You know, don't know, don't know what of. But uh, um, so, so normals that we, we, as far as we can tell, they are conscious. I mean, you, you know, this, the problem is, is hard, and deep, and, but, but they're conscious. Some of them do not show, and even when they are aware, 
they do not show the electromyographic response. And this is because the way people react to this is very, very different. Some people know that the stimulus is going to come, but they still come. Instead of tensing the eyelid, they stay calm and relaxed, like, like just uh, it's going to come, so I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. <laughs> uh, so so this, is why, this is why it, it the lack of signal, of, of electrophysiological signal, is not indicative of the lack of consciousness. But from the squire's data, the presence of this signal is indicative of uh, a covert or, or, or a conscious uh, knowledge of the contingency. Yeah. I think 20%, uh, uh, but I, I don't, I, it's close to. I mean, it's, it's, it's less, but, but, but it's a substantial amount of people. That, that, and you get different profiles of responses also. So, so the, the taxonomy of how people, when they understand that something wrong is going to, that there's going to be an air path to their eyes, how they exactly they predict that in terms of the pattern of, of motor movements is very variable. From complete relaxation to, but the typical profile, which is the one that we use statistical, because if not, because you don't have too many subjects here, you cannot go on to this profiling of actually trying to understand all the different ways in which people can react. So this is, this is, this is a, a bit of a simplified version of this. Okay, so uh, I, I have one more, and it's the last one. Again, this is, this is by no means a complete description of all the signatures of consciousness. There, there's many people, me among them, that, that, have, that, that try to come up with a taxonomy, again, of what are the fingerprints? What is it in the human brain that you have to look to understand that the agent is conscious? And, and you get a flavor of how these experiments are done. You manipulate consciousness with drugs, uh, with sleep turning on and off, uh, with an experiment in which there are fluctuations of, the, of being conscious of, of a particular item or not, and you try to look within patterns of brain activity what are the most reliable signatures of consciousness going on and off. And typically what one would want to do is, is that, that this is not a completely uh, brute force approach, but it's, it's driven by, by our psychological understanding of what consciousness is about. And I gave you the previous example, which was consciousness, one of the things that it's involved is with binding things in time. Another thing that we are all aware that consciousness, how conscious uh, thought work, uh, functions, is that it's, uh, it's what, what uh, William James, the, the famous uh, psychologist, is uh, described as, as the stream of thought. And this is something that, that, I mean, in between scientists, we are particularly familiar with. It's, it's that consciousness has a certain degree of complexity in that, maybe not ergodically, but it's sampling a large number of states. So one, on a way, would think, and one could conjecture, and one would like to examine the hypothesis that whatever the physiology of consciousness is, it has to instantiate this idea that consciousness is within certain stable structure sampling a wide range of, of states. So there, there are a, a bunch of, of, of information, uh, theoretical approaches to trying to understand the finger, fingerprints of consciousness. And this is one uh, within them. This is done in the, in the brain of monkeys, so non-human primates. And it's a very different, uh, 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 again, it's fMRI. And so very similar technique than I said before, except that it's not, they're not transient experiments in the sense that there's not a, a stimulus like, like now think about something and you see how the, how the temporal signal actually is encoding this, this transient. But those are stationary experiments. So you have a monkey and the monkey is staying in the scanner for about 30 minutes. And the question is, we, we study the, the structure of the, the covariation matrix of uh, spontaneous fluctuations. And this is done in different states and the question is how these uh, correlation matrix or, or this similarity of temporal profiles may be indicative of different states. And again, this is a long industry of studies. There are many uh, of this kind. And when you do that, uh, I'm showing here, so essentially, uh, so what you have, again, is, is uh, 60,000 temporal signals. These 60,000 temporal signals are coarse grain uh, to about between, so in this case, it's 80. But in, in, the, in the order of magnitude of hundreds, this is typically how it is done. And this coarse grain, graining is typically done by anatomical criteria. So, so uh, by, uh, there are other studies that are used to actually 60,000 boxels. 60, boxels. And then eventually, you, you look at the average or the first principal component of, of sets of boxels that define regions that either you can find through hierarchical clustering or by anatomical labeling. You have a different ways of actually reducing the dimensionality. And eventually, you have a, in the order of 100 temporal signals. And you look for the correlations of these signals. And then you get these, these, these matrices of correlations. 
And then eventually you do that in time with sliding windows and you look, you do spatial temporal clustering of these and you find uh, that there are patterns that form and unform. And of course, there's, here there are seven patterns. There's nothing fundamental of that. So we've set the algorithm to find seven clusters. You could play the game of trying to see how many patterns really there are there, but that depends a lot on, 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 the, on your resolution. So I don't think that there's nothing fundamental on, on that. Uh, and, and here you find seven patterns. And this is the, uh, uh, con the, the anatomical connectivity matrix. So again, a, a coarse grain. So you have the brain, of course, these, these anatomical regions that are connected by fibers of different uh, thickness. And you can thr threshold the thickness and then declare that two regions are connected if there's substantial white matter that connects these two regions. And then you, when you find all these states, essentially what you can do is just a measure of similarity of these functional states, of, of functional covariance, of the similarity of the temporal profiles to uh, the anatomical matrix. And in a way, you can say that states that are very close to these are kind of trivial states, where eventually what you have is something like you could think of passive diffusion within this structure that's conditioned by, by, the, by the anatomical topology of the network. And eventually, you get to richer states that, of course, they have an underlying uh, anatomical connection, which is not seen at this degree of resolution, but that you alternate between these two different states. Can you just explain what the squares These squares? So this is a correlation matrix between this is this is what I was I was so so you have red red means that the correlation is very positive so it means that so so what you have here is different voxels different regions of the brain uh, and and the same different regions of the brain if you have a red voxel this is is blurred sorry there, for some reason the image came out blurred but something which is red means that this voxel is very similar in time so it has the, the temporal profile is very similar to another voxel. And I'm not showing here what these regions are, but this is what you see here. In whenever you see a, a, a red line, it means that there was a, a significant correlation between the temporal profile of a region that was here with a region that was in this place here. And, and for the purpose of what I'm saying here, and I, on this, this special particular spatial detail of these maps, there's nothing that I think is substantial or, or is important for, for what I would like to communicate today. There, there is structure, people work on these particular shapes and why this region is connected with this one and not with this other one and what's the functional significance of that. The point I want to make today, because I think in, in the, in what I'm saying is that when you now do the, the occupancy of these uh, brain states in a state of consciousness and a state of unconsciousness, which is what's shown here. So, so consciousness and consciousness here, it's, it's not by pathology, as I showed before with vegetative states. But it's, um, it's, with, um, it's with anesthesia. And this is propofol. So, so those are hypnotic uh, anesthetics. And here, there's no anesthesia. So it's the condition where we think that the monkey is, is, awake, is awake and conscious. And this is moderate sedation. And this is deep sedation. And what you have here is the, all the different states that have been sorted or they have been ranked by, by how similar they are to the, to the anatomical matrix of connectivity. So again, you could think that states that are here are more trivial states, and states that are here are less trivial states. And the point is that, that, that in the awake case, you spend a lot of time in all these states, regardless of whether they're very similar to the, to the, to the uh, anatomical connectivity or not, while in deep and moderate sedation, so in lack of consciousness, the brain states are, are less entropic, so to say. So they, they stay much more time in, in war, one particular state. And this state is one that's much more similar to the, to the state of anatomical connectivity. So so how do you define these seven yeah, this is a, a little bit of, of, of tradition. It doesn't If you do it with 12 or, or 14, uh, so, so this is a, 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 when you are doing the, the clustering of this, you get a validity of so how, how uh, the degree of overlap between the different clusters. And you have stopping criteria for that. If you would use it this way, typically you, you would stop between 7 and 12. That's, that's a typical number that you would get. How do you think about this? In, you take some resources. Yeah, no, no, no. They, they, yeah, 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 yeah. And you have this covariance matrix. Yeah, so, so, if, so, yeah, yeah. So, so, if you, so now if you take the entire signal and you project it to these seven states, yeah. it's not like you will be in state 1 and then completely and then jump to so typically occupancies are you maybe like 60 percent of the variance is explicated it's ex explained by by this, this is a basis. yeah it's a basis, so the basis 
Well, it's a basis in the sense that they are they are when they, that they are the uh, st states that 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 describe a maximal variance uh, of your data. So essentially, what you're doing is is uh, so you could think I mean you, you could think this of as, as a vector, and and so what you have now is a vector in time, and this vector is moving in in, in this space, and eventually what you're looking at clusters clustering in the in the and and these clusters are overlapping. So they're, they're, they're not complete clusters. Again, there's, but once again, the point here is, so there's another aspect, which is a, a how well this basis is descriptive of the dynamics of brain patterns. A, here, I'm not even dealing with this. The only thing I'm saying is, is once we choose this basis, is what is the degree of occupancy of these states in a state of consciousness or unconsciousness. And again, yet another fingerprint, which is one, there are many similar ideas. I will show just one now, which is that, that again, that, that one feature of consciousness, and again, it's a fingerprint of, of consciousness, is the fact that when, when in different ways you look at information content in the conscious brain or in the unconscious brain, then you get much more information in the, in the, in the, in the conscious brain. It's it's a reasonably good basis again, but but the aim I want to make is here no, some some yes yes so so the states, group, what what you could map is that the states that are closer to 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 the anatomical states are so if if you take if you if you take the 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 entire brain, and you could measure the correlation function, of of course there's a lot of structure. But the, the, the most prominent pattern is that you have two anticorrelated networks. So there's, there's a, there's, there are regions of the brain that are, 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 are self-similar and that are anticorrelated with other different regions of the brain. And these, these two ones here, as you go into the extremes, somehow you're navigating these, these uh, two extremes, which would be a first order parcellation. And when you do that, these, these two regions, the one that's, that's, that's here, more similar to the anatomical state, is expressed when people are on what we phenomenologically perceive as, as mind wandering. So when we are distracted, when we are closer to drowsiness, when uh, we are not doing anything that requires active effort or the feeling of, of taking our mind to volitionally do something, uh, this would be uh, what you would experience if you're in one of these states. While these states here are states that are much more goal directed. So that when you're doing something that, that requires effort and, and so on. Uh, that's that's what typically is the case. So again, just just one uh, 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 small uh, pairing of the idea I just gave is is for many years the people that that did research that then was abandoned in the 70s on trying to explore not shutting down consciousness but changing actually its quality or its quality by using psychedelic drugs. One of the of the of the most reported phenomena was the idea of of of, of a perceived expansion of consciousness. So the idea that, 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 that uh, and, and again, this is not a demonstration of this by any means. It's just a, a, a suggestion, so to say, uh, that, that when you look at what goes on in the brain of a person that has taken psilocybin in this case, but it would be exactly the same with LSD or with other uh, psychedelic drugs, then, uh, and, and this is a very different measure but it's on the same essence. So, so Enzo Tagliasucci here, my colleague, he took four different regions of the brain, which were particularly relevant in what people uh, in the in what people do, were doing here. And here you have the four different temporal profiles. And again, you see that there are moments of similarity. And these profiles correspond to uh, two regions: the hippocampus and the anterior cingulate, and to the left and to the right. So it's it's a, it's a network of four nodes here. This is this was the particular choice here. And you see that there, there are different moments of similarities, which have been caricatured here. So in, in this moment, the signal is quite similar to this one, but that's the, the only one similarity here. And in the end, these two become more self-similar. And so the idea is that now uh, these, uh, these correlation matrices have been forced and pushed to motifs, which as you see, they're not strong. I mean, they're, they're not, I mean, it's just a thresholding of similarity that's then described as a motif. And then you can measure the transition of these motifs and you can calculate the entropy. And when this is done with a drug which is a placebo, 
then you don't get an effect in the, in the entropy measure of that. But when this is done with psilocybin, again, this psilocybin is the drug of, 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 of mushrooms, uh, and it's a highly psychedelic drug, then the effect is that you get a, a, a larger uh, entropic occupation of states uh, as, as, as a function of time. So just, again, an idea is that, is that in the unconscious state with anesthetic drugs, you project the brain to a, to a, to a, to a, to a dynamics of, of very low entropy. Consciousness increases this entropy, and there are drugs that actually can increase this entropy even farther. And these drugs are perceived phenomenologically by the people that describe them as drugs that are actually expansive of the experience of consciousness. So I, I made this very clear in the beginning. I think we don't know what is the fundamental nature of, of, of consciousness and its qualia and its content, but we have these traces in which we can try to relate what we describe as the experience of consciousness to physiological markers of this experience. And the last uh, example I want to give for this is, uh, I think, yet, you see how I think that the, the, the idea of consciousness becomes very interesting in, uh, so I gave the example of vegetative state patients. So those are ca cases where I think that the, that the consciousness of the other agent are under a question mark in the sense that it's very hard to, to make inferences without this type of techniques. And another case is infancy. I think that, that we would like to know, and it's very hard to know what's the conscious state of a newborn. Do they have a consciousness that's similar to, of course, we cannot ask. And so we have to use these fingerprints to make our best educated guesses uh, uh, to inquire about this issue. So I'm going to, again, be, be quite partial about this. This is a study that we did in Paris a few years ago. It was in three-month-old infants. MRI is very innocuous uh, in terms of, of much more, actually, than echography, just to give an, an example of something. Echography. Echo echography. Echography? Is it echography in English? Echography. Echography. So, so eco sound, sound. So echography, which is done on, 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 on neonates all the time. What I'm, I'm saying this, those are very healthy experiments, just for the, I mean, the, the uh, and, and what you see here is this baby is still alive, and I think that there's a good reason that, 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 that science actually gives us good, good arguments on why we can do this experiment. I say this because I think that that's something that may come to mind. It would come to my mind if I were not to know this data. And so uh, this is, again, one aspect of, of consciousness, which is language. And so what you have here is the brain of an adult uh, listening to sentences. And what you have in colors here, sorry, in a color map which goes from, from blue uh, to red, so from, from cold colors to warm colors, and we have the scale, sorry, I should have the scale, my mistake. And it's in the scale, it's in the range of seconds. It's not the amount of the activity as typically described in, in fMRI, but the uh, dynamics of the activity. So you can imagine that this is a measure of information flow. And, um, and, and, and so actually, this is very effortful because as, the MRI signal is filtered. I, 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 I told you in the beginning that the MRI signal uh, has to, it measures the hemodynamic response function, so the, the blood response to the metabolic consume based of neural activity. And this is very slow. It's in the order of about seven or eight seconds, so it's low filtered. But it has the advantage that it's quite stationary. And so because it's quite stationary, it can be deconvolved. And so there are different efforts to try to improve the uh, resolution in an order of magnitude, which is something that can be done with different phase triggering techniques. And, and so what you have here is, 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 is people that are listening to sentences, adults like you, like it would be your brain now uh, would express something similar to this. You see very strong activation in the auditory cortices, and this is very hard to see from the blurring of the colors, but we can measure this. The auditory cortex is organized in a stream of processing layers that go from the primary auditory cortex, which is in the more medial part of the brain, to the more uh, associative auditory cortices, which actually receive information downstream from these layers as one goes lateral. And, and, and of course, you cannot see this from here. But, but if we would draw a line here and measure the profile of faces, you could see that the in color, the timing. color is timing. Timing of the responses locked to the onset of the sentence. Blue, uh, uh, yeah, and blue is these signals that actually anticorrelate, because this is out of phase. And so what you're seeing here is what I said before of two networks that are anticorrelated. What is blue is very late. And actually, it's, it's not that it's late. It's that it's negative responses. So they are in, because this is actually quite cyclic. You see it just as, as half I, I of. Think of you see some signals. Yes. So the color changes after how much, how much time. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, but I'm saying something else, which is that for blue. So, so this is the pulse, and you'll get a signal like this, and this will have a face. It will be maybe a, a, like yellow, and then you get a signal which is slightly lower, and it will do something like this, and this will be so. This would be yellow, and this will be red. But then you have other voxels that are actually anti-correlated, so they, they deactivate and they go like this. And so those you see in this analysis as half of cycle out of phase from this. So those are the ones that you see in blue. So what I'm saying is the ones that you see in blue, it's not that they're delayed, it's that they actually, they're negative. So you're seeing the, the, the 180 degree rotation for the change of sign in the response. So what I was, I was telling before of these two networks, one that's engaged when you're doing something that requires effort and one that disengages in the midline, this is what you're seeing here. This is a complementary view of what I said before. And so you see this organization in, in, the, in the auditory cortex, and then you see below that, so, so downstream from that, you see this activation in a region of the brain that, that is very famous, has been widely studied, called the Broca region. So this, this, this has the name actually of a neurologist, Paul Broca, uh, who discovered that this region was necessary for the, for the production of sentences. So people that have a lesion here, they understand language, they can comprehend language, but they cannot produce an articulate language. So it is as if the feeling would be as if you would have words all the time in the tip of your tongue. You can think of language, you can understand language, you think you can conceive language, but in the moment you want to articulate, you just cannot. Uh, and this is called aphasia. And I told you that this is the brain of people listening to sentences, adults. And when adults listen to sentence, nevertheless, they activate a brain region which is involved the, in the production of sentences. And this is, this is something that's, that's very spread in neuroscience, which is that it's very difficult to, uh, you, you know this experiment, like, if not, you can do it. Like you're talking to someone and you cross your arms. And you'll see that almost inevitably, I mean, with a probability, I'd say of 60%, uh, the person in front of you will cross your arms. And, and, and once you really, you just cross your arms. And, 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 and once, once this happens, it's very disturbing because it's like, like you feel uh, I'm ruining your life with this because uh, you can push this harder. You go like this and you'll see that, of course, smiling and, and I mean, there are all these, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, so in adults, I mean, there's this, this was just a, a refined version of something that was completely known. But again, this is a probe uh, for uh, what goes on in babies that are three months old. And for those of you, when I did this study, I didn't have children and I didn't know what three months old meant. Three months old are very far from, from speaking. Children begin, I mean, I need to calibrate you on orders of magnitude of that if you're not. Children start speaking at around when they're one year old. So it seems only nine months, but if you think it like geometrically, it's they have to quadruple their lifetime yet to reach this stage in which they're speaking the first words. And the result, yes. This is for, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you have to understand. Yeah, you have to understand if the prosody of the language. So it would work if, if you have a vague understanding of the language. Again, there we, we could go on what are the differences in, in brain responses. To, it's not exactly the same, but, but first order approximation doesn't matter so much if it's your native language or not. This is for native language. But of course, native language is not so meaningful in three months old baby. And you see, again, the data uh, is much more lousy. Uh, this is babies which are three months old now. So this is in adults, and this is in, in three months old babies. Uh, you have all sorts of problems. I mean, they, they not, don't, do not always comply as you would want. They fall asleep, they move, they cry, they, they cheat. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's wet physiology. So, so you get all the, all the and, and they're difficult experiments uh, uh, for, for reasons you can imagine. Uh, and again, I'm not going on, on to the hearts that this, this, this is something I spend a lot of time in, in, in my life actually showing that this is very robust. And, and I'm at, I mean, you can, you can look at the papers. So the point, so the point, so, so the point, the point is that there is activation in the auditory cortex. That activation in the auditory cortex shows a similar pattern of migration. And then, then there is later activation, and this is the important part, that the Broca area is activated. And it's activated with a profile which is similar to the activation that we find in adults in the sense that it's downstream. Broca, well, because again, this is just the, the, the signal. I mean, if I would have lowered a little bit the threshold, then you would see it. This is just a cutoff of, this is much more variable signal. And so I don't think that there's nothing fundamental between the, 
it's just a, a cutoff of the and this is one slice again we can go on the paper if you we can go together in it if you want but uh, there, there are many of, of, of you know these the slides and, and, and you get much more redundant data so but the point is that you get late late later compared to the activation of the auditory cortex activation of the Broca region which is downstream of the auditory cortex and this is in children that that are again three months old that are very far from overtly in a way that's tangible from the outside speaking their first words now this is the data and I will tell you what my conjecture is this is an inference which goes beyond the data but to me it's the most reasonable inference I can make from this data which is that and and to me this was important in the sense of how I relate to, to to my sons for instance I mean this is the kind of science where I think we're we are in the dark and we are trying to conjecture about uh, the capacities of the other and the, and the limitations and the difficulties and, and where I think that neuroscience may actually help us uh, to understand each other. I mean, it, again, partially, like, like all, 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 all partial data. So my, my reading of this, and, and, and again, I emphasize this, this is, a, this is the data, now I'll go beyond the data, is that children, when they're three months old, they are, on a way, silently beginning to speak. So they are trying to exercise the network of language by making an exercise of language which is not yet observable from the outside because it's not articulated by the motor system. They may yet not have the capacity to express this and to convert it into words, but they are, again, I don't know about that. This is my best inference, my best guess from the data. If this is true, then the way I relate to a three-month-old infant is different because I assume in, if, if you have someone that you see that they are trying to walk spontaneously what you will do is what's the most important part of pedagogy you will scaffold this process so you'll give them a hand to make that easier if you think that a person that's three months old is trying to speak and is exercising this process and you did not see that just because they did not exteriorize this this uh, process of thought So, so babies are not yet uh, producing sentences at three months old. So they are not using the Broca region in the way that we know it's being used in adults in direct relation to the articulation of sound. They are not articulating sounds. Now, uh, as, as we saw in the vegetative state patients, and we know for many other features of human behavior, there are many thought processes that are not exteriorized. So again, I cannot conclude this from this data, but, but at my best guess, again, and this is the, the beginning of how we may begin to understand how thought is when you are an in, a pre-verbal infant that cannot communicate the content of your thoughts, is that there may be a life which is much richer than the one you would conclude from an external observation of the output of this mental life. This is, this is the, the... And of this particular last sentence, there, there, there are many, many demonstrations. So until the 70s, yeah, just one second, until the 70s, by large, the, into the, the, the conclusion of, of psychological science, which is the most natural intuition, is that babies are born as a tabula rasa. And today, there's very substantial evidence indicating that they have all sorts of knowledge, very abstract forms of knowledge, which they do not express and they do not convey, but they have within. We don't we'll know if they're conscious of this knowledge. So just to give you one example, which is they have uh, intuitions of mathematics. So Lee Spelke in Harvard, Stan Dehan, my, my, my old director, in, in, and many others have done this class of experiments where you show newborns hours out of the womb, of the womb like really new, first day uh, in life outside, the, outside the, 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 their mothers. Uh, and you'll, you'll do this experiment. You'll show a, visual, a sequence of visual stimuli that goes like this. It has three ducks and then three squares, large squares, and then three small points, and then three blue lines, and then three houses. So you see the point. They're all different in the surface. They're large, they're small, they have color, they don't have color, they're complex, they're simple. You're trying to just have a category where everything varies except one very subtle notion, which is the threeness of this category. They're always three. And suddenly you put four squares or four triangles, uh, or, and then you do it the other way around. And in the moment you change the category from three to four, then babies react. 
you can see that from their brain, there's a signal in the parietal cortex that distinctive in this particular moment, and you can see it by very subtle measurements of gaze or by the amount of sucking that they, they do of, of a, so they're, there's, they're somehow declaring that they understand that the category has changed. And the category is a very subtle one. It's one of, of course, it's, it's deeply abstract. It's, it's an arithmetic category. That doesn't mean that babies can add. That doesn't mean that babies can use in a purposeful, in a, in a meaningful manner, their knowledge of mathematics. That means that their brain is incapable of encoding very subtle notions of mathematics. And the same is true for many other dimensions uh, where people have seen more and more that, that the infant mind actually is, 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 is charged from birth uh, with a whole set of intuitions that actually, from which then we build on uh, knowledge and concepts. One of them is language. Uh, yes? What kind of knowledge of language do you have? Babies have? So, so some, some, I don't imagine, some we know. So for instance, the same, the same experiment I just said with, with numbers is done with language. And so you'll take uh, almost newborns. I think this, this study was done, I think it was done by Jack Meller. And I think it was in, in one month old uh, infants, the, at least the one I remember, in which again, similar thing, they're listening into sentences in, in, for instance, say in Japanese, and one sentence, long sentences, short sentences, with uh, different prosodies pronounced by a male, by a female. The only common thing is that they're Japanese. And suddenly, they, there's a change and they're pronounced in Dutch. And in the moment this happens, there's a differential response, so you'll see a signal that actually attenuating and attenuating in each sentence, so you'll see strong signal to the first one and then it goes down and down and down and down, and the moment in which you change the language, boom, it suddenly goes up again. And again, you'll see your sort of reactions. And if you, so you will say, well, they're just distinguishing some auditory regularities, but then you play the game in which you just reflect the sound, so you present exactly the same thing, but the, like the disc, uh, you, 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 so you just change time by minus time. You play back, you play backwards, and you do the same experiment, and they don't react. Which means that what, what, what is this saying? This is a very, I mean, fundamental Chomsky idea, which is that the brain from birth is prepared or is suited or is adapted for certain form of computations among all possible forms of computations. It's specialized, which include, among other things, detecting features that are relevant for language. For instance, prosody. Uh, for instance, the, the, the different intonations of language. And so babies are, uh, and learning language involves many different components. You have to learn the prosody of a language. You have to learn, for instance, one thing that the majority of the people do not think about is, is when you learn language. People, when, 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 when you, you think about language learning, people think about meaning and grammar. Those are like the two components. But one thing you have to, the first thing babies have to learn is, is, is the statistical parsing of language. So in fluid speech, like I'm doing now, there's no silence. If you would see the spectrogram of what I'm saying, you wouldn't see the border between words. You perceive a border between words because you know what the words are, so you know how to parse it. But for instance, when I hear to German, which I don't speak, it's not that I don't understand the words. I don't know where the words are. It's like a continuous stream of sound. And so the question is, how do babies do that? How do babies learn where the borders of, so they are doing some form of statistical learning. So what, what I'm saying is that the exercise of language goes through, through infancy with many different forms of computation, which I think, again, we have one data set saying that one, among many other ones, saying that they are uh, expressing attributes of language. How exactly? I, I don't think they understand. They don't have semantics yet. I don't think that they understand the meaning of chair or, or that they understand the meaning of democracy. Or that they can, or that they can produce, or well, you, you'd be surprised, or or that you'd be surprised. Yesterday, I mean, but they, to a, I mean, it'd be more surprising than anything. But but they are exercising, and I think what so what I think babies are doing by by with language here is that they're just playing the music of the language. They are listening to a sentence and they're trying to repeat it to learn the prosody and the music of the language. Yes. Yeah. 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 I. I. It might be. I don't know. I mean, this. I. It might be. I don't know. Mm -hmm. no, yes. I mean, 
Yes, faster they can, and this is yeah. So I, yes, they can, and actually this is this is yesterday we had we had a conversation in in the sociology uh, in the school of social science, and, and 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 this came along as I think it's it's a very important one. So babies understand many aspects of language before they can produce it, and this is fundamentally an articulatory difficulty. So so whatever it's just learning the instrument. We know. I mean, I I can know the theory of piano. And I can and I can know all of it, but I cannot play it because just my hands are not good enough to. So this this is a very strong barrier during the language process. It's not the understanding of language, but the articulation of language. So it's known that if that they can express language earlier through sign language than they do through. Yeah, this is also done through the to a large extent through the vocal part. Yes, and and one more thing, uh, which I think it's an it's a it's an it's an interesting thing of, of the kind of neuroscience I'm showing today is I think one of the most uh, practical, relevant implementations of of neuroscience is that now so the ear uh, is it's an ensemble of of of, of cells that have so it's it's like it's like, a, it's like a piano almost so it has it has it has it has an array of cells called hair cells that resonate at different frequencies, and these cells are very close to a to a hop bifurcation, which means that eventually they will start producing sound. And actually, if you do record from a, from a ear and you lower the sound a lot, you will start hearing a, a lot of the of the of the sound production of the ear. Something that many people actually perceive themselves in something that's called tinnitus, which is when you hear like a, like a ringing sound from your ear, which is a degeneration of the system. Now, based on that, on on, on re resonant properties of of of, of, of these cells. You can detect the the wellness of the of the functioning of the of the auditory system at birth, and this is done now. It's 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 a standard procedure now. And what this allows you again, and it's very similar in spirit to the other things I've shown, is before you have behavioral evidence, which is what you have heard, to know that a children has a very high likelihood of being deaf. And if you do that, then you have an opportunity of communicating with this young infant for a year because they understand, except that their, their auditory system doesn't work. And so this has changed enormously uh, the fate of these children that for often long time, months, year, and often two years, they, people insisted in using a channel of communication for which they were simply unprepared. So yeah, this, this, is, this is an, an important example. How are we doing on time? Because I, uh, maybe it's, yes. Yeah, so an adult talking, an adult talking, you would you would see a m much stronger activation of this region, which is the broker region. So what, but but what I'm saying is that when you listen to sentence, there is a process of I imitation and articulation, which you often does not go overt, but it can. You can, I mean, do minimal uh, 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 actually expressions of of the mouth and of the articulatory system that correspond to the sounds that you are listening. And, and so, so the, the, of course, with babies, we cannot ask them to, to produce learning because they do not produce it overtly. But we could ask, and again, the inference is indirect, and you're right, and, and I, I emphasize this, in that what we are using to make this claim is that they're activating a region, which is the Broca region, which we know is used for articulation of language. So, so, uh, so this, this, is, this, this is the essence of, of the argument. The reason of why we don't do an experiment of articulation or production of language is because in babies we cannot ask them to, to, to produce sentences. If you broke the broker region, not the broker language, the broker region. Yes, but this is one of the most distinguished. It, in primates, you find analogs of the broker region, uh, but but it's one of the most specialized. So when you do a comparative analysis, and you'll find similitudes and differences between the non-human non primates and the primates. Broad region is one of them where you have maximal di di divergence. Uh, but, but it is present. So the role of the Broca region is, 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 is complex. And what exactly the Broca region is doing exactly is, is, of course, a much more complex. I'm simplifying this here. Uh, one of the ideas is that it's also involved in, 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 recurs in recursion which is, again, a very Chomsky idea, so, so that whatever operation that requires a recursive processing, including music, will actually uh, engage uh, the Broca region. So maybe there, there's not one functional role for, for the Broca region. 
I think maybe, so I have more, but m probably it's time to stand. I, th I think it, it should be so. Because this went with many questions, and I'm happy to. It's at three, so I think it's it's quarter to three. I, th I think we can call it, uh, as, uh, and, and and maybe if, if there are some more questions. Yeah, but it would be a, a, a yeah. I'll say I'll, I'll speak very briefly about that. Um, let me see. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll give you my talk. No, uh, because th there's nothing worse than just giving. I, th I think I think the so so let me just give you this. I think that this is interesting. How so? And I'll, I'll give you one one more slide, which is just a, I think a f an interesting and it's not my work. Uh, but I think it's it's relevant, and that that was the building part of, of what I was going to talk. And I'll I'll just finish with this, which is the following idea. Um, so I, I try to convey how we can use different experimental procedures generally to ask about the pattern of thought of other people where this question otherwise would be hard. So. How, what is the mind of a vegetative state patient? How is the mind of an infant? How is the mind of a person that's un undergoing uh, uh, an hallucinatory experience? How is the mind of a dreamer, which I didn't show, but I would have shown? Now, one thing which I think is, is to, to me, al was always an interesting question is, is how was the mind of our ancestors? How were the mind, I mean, how did the Romans think, or the Greeks, or the people in the caverns? And, and I think that very rapidly we have a very strong first intuition which is that, that there are some fundamental aspects of human thought, like they had to have language. But we know this is not true. Language has not, so language is not an obligatory construction of human thought. Many societies have gone through without language. Consciousness. Is consciousness just a, a default state of, of, of the human? Is it, is you just let a, a human go through life without a social experience, without education, will they have consciousness? And will this consciousness be similar or not to the one? So you see how this question is, is very hard, and, and I was going to go on to this. I will not. But an, an idea which is kind of an obvious one, and I think it links to, on a way, to cosmology as, as, as a general project, is that we, do not, we cannot take an MRI and, and yet and measure uh, the, the workings of the brain of, of our ancestors, but they left traces of their thoughts. So we have you know, our own radiation. They drew things, they uh, wrote things, they moved things, they built tools. And so there is a, 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 an aspect of science, which of course is much more difficult, e even more difficult than the one I just showed now, which is trying to reconstruct patterns of thought by the traces, by the fossils uh, that these humans left, which I think is a very intriguing way. And, and of course, if there is text, text is the most uh, obvious way of doing so, because text is very self-speaking of how people thought. It requires some analysis, but, and so this is the direction I was gonna go, and I just want to show you a picture because I think it's quite interesting to, to show you now how, because we have all, all, all this data of, of, of patterns of thoughts that have been put into useful data, digitalized books, the kind of questions that we can ask. And so, so Google, a, a few years ago, uh, uh, produced a, a, a repository in which many of the books produced by humanity were digitalized and made available for the analysis that one would want to use. And this is the kind of questions that you can ask. And, and again, I was going to go after that. So for instance, you can ask about the usage of the word slavery in an in, in, in integral of all the US texts, which includes the newspapers and the books. And you see that it's a term that people have spoken, but there were certain moments in which people sp spoke a lot about slavery. And you see that, not so surprisingly, that these moments have a temporal relation, which is actually predictive of civil crisis. So it's people were speaking about slavery, and, and, and you could see that this was a, an issue at discussion, which eventually resolved on, on a war that then, uh, you, can f you can see how people uh, think about crisis. So this is the usage, this is, this is one I like a lot. So the use of the Great War, 1914 people were, were there was, people thought that there was a war that was the Great War, of course, because it was the only one, and eventually this term completely vanished because there was a second world war, and so the world war was changed by the first world and the second world, and so on. And uh, this is, you, you can see censure. So by the absence of, of things that are not said, 
you can understand things of humanity. So, I mean, those things, of course, need no explanation. There's, there's no relevant science. It's just, just the, just the discourse of. A, but, but I think that again, it's, 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 it's a proof of case of how these things can be do. So, you see the, 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 how the total counts of Marc Chagall uh, in history, and, and you see this moment of clear absence, which again does not uh, necessitate any explanation. And the last one. And with this, we can close as you can see what it is that builds human fame or what it is that we remember, what it is that we concentrate on. And here you have Mickey Mouse, Marilyn Monroe, Che Guevara, Jimmy Carter, politicians. And here you have, the, so what's, what's been done here is, is you take the most famous people and then you just see from the, eight, the year they were born. And, and uh, the, uh, again, their, their fame measured for how much they speak on them. And you, you get the political fee. You see actually the building up of these different profiles. And you see how politicians, it's, they're not spoken of until a moment in which there is this very sharp transition. And there are other ones that have these, 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 these progressive buildups. And we are somewhere here. And if you're a mathematician, <laughs> uh, you're somewhere there. So it can be. And again, our representation of knowledge with Stan, we have all these conversations about how how some things dominate the scientific scene. So people spoke of genes and everything has to be the genes or the, and again, you can start asking these questions about how we are thinking. We are, it's questions of, of collective thought. And so here you have different scientists and, and you see, of course, Freud uh, completely overrules the scene. And then you have how evolution has eventually dominated the scientific DNA. So something that, of course, no one spoke until DNA came, but now we are all speaking about DNA. And you can start uh, asking these questions and then eventually take them down to the far past of human writings to, again, ask the questions. Try to ask, which is what, what I was going to share, which, which I won't have time. Try to be. Time, then the last OK, then, then in the last question, you can ask that. So yeah, so, so I'll, I'll give you a short, uh, this, is, this is, it's hard to summarize in one minute, which is what I will, I will do. So Julian Jaynes, I think it's worth naming, because he was here at Princeton. Uh, one of the most polemic uh, experimental psychologists, I think, ever, um, had this very weird idea uh, that, that was very resisted uh, in, the, in the community, which is his claim was that, that on, he asked the question, which I posed to yourself, and he tried to respond it. And he did that by reading the ancient text. There is a moment between called the Axial Age, which is between 3,000 years ago and 2,000 years ago. This is the moment in which all over different places in the world, there was an emergence of, of our current philosophies and religions. So it's a moment of transformation of all cultures. And James, by reading these books in the Judeo-Christian tradition and in the Greco-Roman tradition and so on, his point was that if you look how people are described in these books, and you take this seriously, you think that this is history and not fiction, this is a, a, a working assumption, then people and, and just give an, an example in the Judeo-Christian tradition, and, and because it's one that, that, um, that you think, well, um, what, what James uh, observed qualitatively in, this, in these readings was that the way people behaved in the very beginning of this story, this history, was as if they had what we call today not volition, or they would not recognize that they were the owners of their thoughts. So they were describing voices that guided their actions. So for instance, you can think of, in the Iliad, you can think of Hector. Almost all his actions, he speaks of Apollo, telling him how he should behave. And interestingly enough, Apollo does not always express itself as a god, what he said it was, but sometimes it's his friend, Apollo. Sometimes it's his cousin, Apollo. Sometimes it's the god, Apollo. Sometimes it's the enemy, Apollo. And so what Julian Shane said, was that in a way, today, if there would be someone like this, we would call this person a schizophrenic, a person that actually is hearing voices and it's following what these voices are actually dictating. And so what these people did not have the capacity, according to James, was to understand that they were the, the, the creators of these voices. We all produce mental rumiations. We all think, oh, I have to go to work. But we understand, which is not what happens during dreams, that we are the creators of this thought. And so we can follow them, we can ignore them, we can act on them. If we don't recognize that we are the creators of these voices, then the most natural assumption is that, again, they are voices that are indicating us what we should do. And so you can try to play this game of trying to, so, so this was very qualitative, and we've done a, a whole research program 
actually trying to prove validity to this uh, by showing that actually, as James predicted, if you actually measure how much there is self-reflection, which is something that today we have the tools because we have quantitative semantics to do these things, that actually there is a transition in the books of history going from characters that actually describe a less volitional form of thought to a more volitional form of thought. But this is something that I think would require much more a reflection than the one we have in a minute. But this, this is the kind of program that, that one could do. The yeah, so you use, you use that for, for this, so, so the difficult part for this, technically the difficult part, is that if you look in the work of, of Homer, the word introspection or self-reflection self or consciousness is not mentioned a single time. And so you want to know that these characters are describing things that involve self-reflection, reading in between the lines. And so for this, what you need to do is, is, is to know that, there, that someone is speaking about something, even if they don't say this thing. And the way of doing that is to build a semantic space in which you have all your meanings, which are in a space. And the notion of speaking about something means that the words are kind of proximal to this concept. And this is something that technologically we can do today and in the days of change it could not be done. So the idea, and this, this of course has, this is what Google uses and, or what any uh, automatic procedure to try to infer meaning use and what we use to know that the other person is speaking about X or something, even if X is never mentioned. This is the technical problem that had to be solved. So it's not like this, that you just count the amount of times that the word introspection is said, but you have to count the proximity of all the words to a given concept. So you have to have a metric, essentially, which we, what you have to do, essentially, is to understand how words are aligned. And, and this is something that today is doable with a very simple algorithm. The, what, what you would do, essentially, is, is declare that two words are the, that this, the, the proximity between two words, and I'm not using yet distance, is their conditional probability of appearing in the same text. So things that are related, that we tend to relate semantically, tend to appear together, you could say in the same sentence or in the same paragraph or in the same, depends, you, you can actually play with the grain of that. And this is not a distance because it's, it, I mean, it's not transitive, but then you can, you, you have a graph and you run Dijkstra on top of that and then you have a distance. And once you have that, essentially you have a very high dimensional space in which the distance between two given meanings is a, is a very good uh, indicator of what we would perceive as the semantic proximity between these things. So for instance, the fruits are all together in a cluster, the body parts are all together in a, in a cluster, and, and the, the abstract terms are all together in a cluster, and you have directions. And the, the direction that people have studied the most is the, the direction of emotions. So you can positive or negative balance. You can measure things. If, if, you have, if you use words that refer to things that have positive emotions or negative emotions, it has become a, a whole practical industry into that. But you can try to identify more abstract and relevant dimensions for science. Like for instance, where people are speaking abstractly or concretely, where people speak revealing using words like guilt or responsibility or self, words that indicate that you think about your own thoughts or they're thinking very concretely and you can identify these different directions and then you can play a quantitative game of converting these qualitative assessments or ideas into quantitative science. Thank you.